tonight we're going to talk about the truth about the Church of Christ. Church of Christ is a, an organization, a, a, a denomination of Christianity that has been around for quite a while, largely from the teachings of a gentleman by the name of Alexander Campbell. By Campbell Soup, not the same guy, but Alexander Campbell. And uh, his followers that then followed what he did and what he believed became known as Campbellites. Campbellites. Mm -hmm. uh, one of their nicknames are water dogs in the South. Mainly because they are so hep or hip or indoctrinated on the idea of baptism. Mm -hmm. So, let's uh, see here. How many, how many do I have today? One, two, three, four, five, six specific distinctions that are probably their biggest ones that they're known for, the Church of Christ. And, uh, and I am a descendant of people that were in the Church of Christ. Uh, my mom grew up in it, and her mom was very steeped in it. And I guess her mom was steeped in it. Uh, so I guess we broke away from it. Uh, just a quick little testimony. One of the things that happened for my mom when she met my dad was I guess she was doing dishes with her uh, husband's mom, I think it was, and uh, when shortly after they were married, and uh, she basically let into the fact that she didn't know if she was going to heaven when she died, and so I believe it was dad's mom that uh, gave her the knowledge that, yes, you can know. First John 5, 13, these Amen. things that I've written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know, the Church of Christ does not really talk much about the words saved. They don't talk about eternal security. They don't talk about knowing. They don't really talk about those biblical terms. They really want to talk about basically uh, getting baptized. If you really spend much time in the Church of Christ, especially in the South, they don't know how to pronounce baptize. It's baptize. <laughs> baptize. So we're going to look at some of these distinctions tonight, and we won't take too long. Just a short little message tonight. Not too much to cover, but uh, the first thing that we're going to cover is the real crux of the matter is baptismal regeneration. And uh, before we get started, let's go ahead and uh, ask the Lord's blessing on the uh, sermon tonight. And I'd like to go ahead and ask Ray if you can pray for that, and then we'll get started. Okay? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, uh, Thank you for having us all here tonight, Lord, uh, to, to hear uh, your teachings on this matter, Lord. Uh, open our eyes and ears, Lord, and to help you understand your word, Lord, and what you say, not what man says, but what you say, Lord. And that we would learn the differences, Lord, so we can know in our hearts and our mind what your word says against false teachings, Lord. Yes. And so, Lord, please... Uh, open our ears and our eyes again, Lord, and thank you for this evening, Lord, and give John, the, Jonathan, the words to speak, Lord, from your word. In your son's holy name, Jesus, amen. 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 All right. Baptismal regeneration. This is the idea that the Church of Christ believes that if you get into the baptismal tank and you decide that you're going to get baptized in water, that is when your sins get officially washed away. And the water regenerates you. And so we were just singing a song, What a Fellowship, What a Joy Divine, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Mm -hmm. uh, a cute little pun to that for the Church of Christ, if they were to sing it, would be uh, Water, fellowship, water, joy divine, Leaning on the temporary water. You know, <laughs> that doesn't work, right? That's horrible. Uh, water is not a joy. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good thing to see somebody get water baptized. I just want you to know that it's not something that we're animos. We don't have animosity towards. But as you know, when, whenever people get so head up into all these different cults, it makes us kind of have to fight against it, obviously. And we may not approach it with as much joy and happiness as we should because somebody else has quote unquote unquote ruined a good thing mm. I have no problem with predestination but the Calvinists have destroyed it for me That's right. I have no problem with the word chosen but the Calvinists have destroyed it for me I have no problem with water baptism but the Catholics and the Church of Christ have destroyed it for me it's I love the Lord's Supper 
but because of what people do with the Catholics and all the Reformed theologies and all these these churches that actually believe it's the real, literal body and blood of Jesus, it kind of ruins it for us a little bit. And so, yes, we do speak against it, but it doesn't mean that we don't like water baptism. Let's look at the first verse tonight, Luke chapter 19, verse 9. Luke chapter 19, verse 9. And we're going to look at some of the verses that obviously talk uh, in regards to baptism. And let's be succinct on this. John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Uh, so, if you're looking at water baptism being the thing that is going to save you, it's just a quinky dinky that Jesus himself wasn't even said by John the Baptist to be baptizing you that way. But look at Luke chapter 19, verse 9. It says this, And Jesus said unto him, This is interesting. This is uh, in reference to uh, the conversion of a despised IRS tax collector, Zacchaeus. Remember Zacchaeus? He found him up in the tree. Jesus saw him. He said, Today I will have dinner with you at your house. I will sup with you at your house. And so he gets down from the tree, takes him to his house, feeds him well. And this is what Jesus says. Jesus said unto him, This day... Is salvation come to this house for so much as he also is the son of Abraham? The son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Verse 10. Jesus says that salvation has come to the house of Zacchaeus and Zacchaeus was not baptized. Think about that. Look at chapter 5, verse 20. Luke chapter 5, verse 20. I'll try to keep the comments to a little bit of a minimum tonight, so that way we can get through all these verses painlessly. And not, I, don't, I don't want to keep you here too long tonight. But it says here in verse 20 of Luke chapter 5, And when he saw their faith, not their baptism, when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. Mm. He didn't have to go into the water tank to get his sins washed away. When he saw their faith, he said unto the man, thy sins be forgiven thee. Okay, had nothing to do with water. Look at chapter 8, verse 48 of Luke. Luke chapter 8, verse 48. And this is very much the same sentiment, but you might as well look at it. It's good to look at these so you can see for yourself that I am not just giving you a bunch of hot air. You know, I'm actually giving you the truth. Amen. Luke chapter 8, verse 48. And he said unto her daughter, Be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Yeah. What made this woman whole was the faith that she had. Not the water baptism. She wasn't even water baptized. Okay, look at 23, verse 43. Luke chapter 23, verse 43. And then we'll quickly try to go through some of the verses that the Church of Christ uses, we are aware of these verses. We are aware of them. Mm. You know, the like figure, aware unto even baptism doth also now save us. We're aware of that. We're aware of Mark 16, 16. Uh, you know, about uh, getting, a, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. We're aware of those verses. But we're going to look at these first, and we're going to compare all these things in context and get the right answer. Luke chapter 23, verse 43 says, and Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Jesus is talking to the thief on the cross. And the thief on the cross obviously was not taken down. And the Romans didn't care to bring a baptismal tank right up there to the cross. You know, So obviously the thief on the cross was also saved, but he was not baptized. Look at John chapter 4, verse 2. The Gospel of John chapter 4, verse 2. John chapter 4, verse 2. We'll start in verse 1 of John chapter 4. And it says here, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. That's a very important one for you to understand because the Church of Christ 
puts great emphasis on the individual that puts the person under the water. And they will actually use the terminology from the preacher's mouth, I saved them. They'll actually say that. So if Jesus wasn't willing to go with them into the water to save them, and that's what saves, what is Jesus doing? That doesn't make sense. Look at 1 Corinthians 1, 14 through 17. 1 Corinthians 1, 14 through 17. And then we'll just do a little quick lesson about water baptism and what it really is, and then we'll get on with the rest of it. I watched, uh, I finally did, against my better judgment, I watched uh, The Jesus Revolution, and I just wanted to check it out and say that I had watched it. And, uh, and it was very interesting. You can tell just by watching it as a Bible believer how much Church of Christ and baptismal significance and baptismal, baptismal spiritualism that is bordering on Church of Christ theology that's in that movie. Mm. And a lot of them are saying, you know, somebody comes out of the water, I think it was, and one of them says, uh, hey, my sins are gone. My sins are washed away. That happened well before they ever hit the water. You know, because it's the belief that saves you. But anyways, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 14 through 17 says, and this is the Apostle Paul. This is very important for you to read and to understand. This is the Apostle Paul saying, I thank God that I baptized none of you. Now, first of all, if, if baptism is going to regenerate you, then the Apostle Paul must have been the most wicked Christian that ever lived. Because what he's basically saying, if you believe in the Church of Christ theology and baptismal regeneration, you believe that when you baptize somebody, they're saved. But Paul is saying, I thank God that I baptized none of you. Paul is saying, I thank God that I didn't save any of you. That's not what he's saying. I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. Now this one you want to underline in your Bible. This is very, very important for you to memorize too. For Christ sent me not to baptize. Hold up. If baptism saves you, and Paul is saying Christ sent me not to baptize, Paul is way messed up. So either Paul is messed up or Alexander Campbell is messed up. Either Paul is messed up or the Church of Christ is messed up. Paul says, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. The Church of Christ has baptism and the gospel so intertwined that if you don't get baptized, you haven't sealed the deal. When we know as Bible-believing Christians that what seals the deal is the Holy Spirit coming in and spiritually circumcising you and spiritually sealing you unto the day of redemption. It's, a, it's an act of the Holy Spirit that does it based upon your belief, not upon any H2O. Okay. So he says, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved, it is the power of God. What saves you? What has the power to save you? The preaching of the cross. It's not water baptism. Now, what does it mean when Jesus says in Mark 16, 16, uh, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. What does that mean? Again, we, we're beating a dead horse here. But for those of you that are watching online, <laughs> and for those of you that maybe haven't been going here long enough, let me explain a little dispensationalism to you. The Lord Jesus Christ here in Mark 16, 16 is giving you the plan of salvation in the sense of the Jews. And he's talking to Jews only. Now look at what he says in verse 16 and then 17 and 18. And that will answer your question. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Notice just for one, for fun. It does not say, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not and is not baptized shall be damned. It doesn't say that. He that believeth not shall be damned. But again, this isn't for you and me anyways. Let me explain. Look at verse 17. And these signs 
shall follow them that believe. Are you a Jew? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to read to you 1 Corinthians 1.10. 1 Corinthians 1.10. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 1.22. 1 Corinthians 1.22 tells you this. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. You see those Jews in that post-resurrection, clear up to Stephen being stoned in Acts chapter 7, water baptism is preached everywhere. You see it in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Uh, and so he said, and repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Mm -hmm. And then ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It doesn't matter what you do with the for the remission of sins part. You still have a problem today. And that is that today, when Lydia and I got saved, when Ray got saved, and I was there when he got saved, mm -hmm. when some of you in here got saved, you got the gift of the Holy Ghost immediately. Mm -hmm. it, water baptism was not a prerequisite, but it was here. You had to be baptized in order to be saved because what is it that seals you on the day of redemption? The Holy Spirit. The Jews needed to be baptized in order to receive the Holy Spirit. In Acts and in Mark 16, 16. That's why it says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But you notice in Acts chapter 10, when Paul is talking with the Gentiles, he says nothing about water baptism. He says that you will receive Forgiveness of sins if you believe mm -hmm. on Jesus Christ. Big difference. No water baptism mentioned. Okay? So, the, you can see now the importance of rightly dividing the word of truth. Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. You have to rightly divide the word of truth. And unless you do that, if you don't do that, you will not be right, you will be not be showing yourself approved unto God. And you'll be showing yourself ashamed. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Mark 16.16 16 is for, for uh, first century Jews before Stephen was stoned. Acts 16.31 is for a Gentile Christian. That's what it's for. There's a big difference. So, water baptism, great. But the plan of salvation, the plan of water baptism for you and me is found in Matthew 28. I'll show you that, then we'll go on to the next one. Matthew 28, verse 19. Matthew 28, verse 19. If you want to write that down, feel free to. Uh, it's a good one for you to rightly divide so you can understand what baptism is for the Jews, what baptism is for the Gentiles, which one goes into all the world and which one goes to just the Jews? Obviously, Mark 16 is going just to the Jews because the signs that follow them that are baptized in Mark 16 is 16 is they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall take up serpents. Have you done any of those things lately? No. No. Why? Because you're not a first century Jew. And the kingdom of heaven was ready to come down if the Jews accepted Christ, and they didn't. When they killed Stephen, God said, fine, I'm done. It's time to call that reprobate Saul who's been killing my people. I'm going to visit him on the road to Damascus, and he's going to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And it's going to be the gospel of the grace of God. I'm going to reveal it to him. And then all of the other disciples who used to be scared of this man is going to have to listen to him. I mean, God does some messed up things sometimes, doesn't he? Puts his own special but he spin does. Yeah. What's that? Puts his own special spin on it. Yeah, he does. When you look at it, it's very humorous what God did. I mean, my. He has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Okay, now let's go to the next one. Uh, some of their biggest distinctions with the Church of Christ is they don't believe in once saved, always saved. We talked about that ad hominem. I mean, just at length last Sunday night. So... If you want to see that lesson, go ahead and watch that. That is on YouTube. But if you haven't seen it and you won't see it because you don't want to see it, I'll at least give you two verses. Galatians 5, 4. So, yes. Are we going to read uh, Matthew yeah, 28, 28 19? Oh, I am sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's why I need my help me. Matthew 28, 19. 
Matthew 28, 19. This is the this is the gospel, this is the uh, the water baptism for the Gentiles. And you'll see what I mean. <clears throat> it says, we'll start in verse 18. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That's, that's definitely Gentiles. It can't be just Jews. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Amen. Jesus baptized, uh, he's telling the disciples to go into all the world and baptize all nations in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. What name is that? That is the name in Acts chapter 10. What is that? Peter baptized them in the name of the Lord. That's the only name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. The Acts 2.38 formula is not what we do at this church. I don't baptize people in the name of Jesus Christ. I choose to follow what Jesus said to do when you're baptizing all nations. Mm -hmm. So I baptize people in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. You say, is it significant? I'm just trying to do the right thing, that's all. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, if I do the Acts 2.38 formula, then what's going to happen is the person I baptize is going to say, now do I have the Holy Ghost? No, you got it long before you got dunked here. You know what I mean? You got saved several weeks ago. I mean, Mike, who got baptized at 76 years old, but he got saved when he was like 20-something. He got the Holy Ghost a long time before he ever got dunked. My Uncle Tim was the same way. My Uncle Tim didn't get baptized till he was 80. And I was there to see it. You know, it was exciting. But I tell you what, it didn't make him any more a Christian. It didn't put him into the body of Christ. When the Bible says that we're baptized into Jesus Christ, what that means is that's that Holy Spirit baptism, which the water baptism pictures. So you get baptized and put into Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit, not by water. You've got to rightly divide the word of truth. Okay? Now... Back to once saved, always saved. They don't believe in once saved, always saved. Look at Galatians 5.4. Galatians 5.4. And this is a verse that uh, the Church of Christ uses quite frequently to try to tell people, well, look, see, you can fall from grace. So there's no such thing as once saved, always saved. But, man, if they just read the actual verse and read the words, they would see that it has nothing to do with them. Yeah. Verse 4 says, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. <laughs> what Paul is saying in the book of Galatians is telling the Galatian church, you got, and it's all through this book, don't Go by the law. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. The law is the dead book. It's a dead letter. The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. The, the letter, the Old Testament, is not going to save you. Uh, the law is now merely only a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. That's all it is. But if you're going to choose to go back into the Old Testament, and try to get more Jewish, and try to get more Sabbath observing, try to take on their diet, and take on how they act on the Saturday, and how they do all this stuff, then, yeah, you're falling from grace. You're being stupid. Mm. You need to come to Christ on His terms. His terms is, this is God talking, basically. I'm just paraphrasing. God says, my righteousness, and how you can get my righteousness is by accepting that Jew that's on that cross. Mm -hmm. And if you want to go to heaven, you can't get there unless you go through Him. That's mm -hmm. right. That's right. That's that's the righteousness of God. Right there on that cross, dying for you. And so we understand we have to get saved by grace through faith plus nothing. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And if you get saved that way, there's nothing that can take you out of that. You're saved? Well then, wouldn't that be horrible if you got saved, but then you could lose it? You know? I've been saved. Oh, glory. Is it eternal life? Yeah, it's eternal life. Oh, shoot, I messed up. You know, I guess I'm done for. 
no, that's not much of an eternal life. <laughs> what was that, five minutes? You know, <laughs> that was a quick life. Man, I feel bad for you. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Colossians 1, 13. Colossians 1, 13. I'm trying to give you verses I didn't give you last week. I'm not sure if I am or not, but I think they're a little bit different. Colossians 1.13. Oh, we'll start in verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us, past tense, from the power of darkness, and hath translated, past tense, us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Have you been translated into his kingdom? Yes. That means you're saved. And if you're translated by him, it don't matter how good of a translator you are, you'll never be able to translate your way out of that. That's right. He is the translator. He's the author and the finisher of your faith. So to believe that, not to not believe in once saved, always saved is, is ludicrous. It's sad. And they believe that you need to believe you need to confess. You need to get baptized. But if you commit an unpardonable sin or something afterwards and you lose your salvation, mm -hmm. you don't need to get water baptized again. Right. Isn't, that, isn't that strange? Mm -hmm. If you lost your salvation and it takes water baptism to get you saved in the first place, why don't you need to get water baptized again if you lost your salvation? You know what I mean? So interestingly enough, that is what they believe. Uh, I'm not part of the Church of Christ because I do believe that when I got saved, I got saved forever. Yes. Forever. Yes. And he did the saving, not me. Mm. How many of you were there on the road to Golgotha helping him carry his cross? Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. <laughs> no, none of you were. Jesus did it all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Okay. And as a consequence, the Church of Christ also does not believe in eternal security. You say, what's the difference? Well, once saved, always saved is basically the idea that if I have been saved, then I will continue to be saved, no matter what. Eternal security is the belief that you are kept by the power of God from the time you're saved through you're secure. You're forever secure. You're safe. They don't believe in that either. And so... You can turn there if you want, but I'm just going to quote it. 1 John 5.13. Uh, 1 John 5.13. Yes, I'm? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> 1 John 5.13 says, These things have I written unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. You must know that you're saved. And they don't believe in eternal security. Look at 2 Timothy 1.12. 2 Timothy 1.12. This is the, that was the Apostle John talking. And now we're going to look at what Paul says to Timothy. Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, he says, For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Are you going to choose to take Jesus at his word? Yes. yes. And if you choose to take him at his word, then why are you doubting your salvation? Mm -hmm. Because somewhere in the back of your mind, you think that you had something to do with it. Mm -hmm. And you got to get that out of your head. Right. you got to get it out of your head as fast as you can. I mean, beat it out, shovel it out, whatever you got to do. <laughs> Just completely. And that's where the rest comes from. A lot of Christians don't have it. I'm safe in the arms of Jesus. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to heaven. Yes. Have you ever just done that at home? Just, mm -hmm. I'm good. I've been made good. <laughs> you know, I've been made good. I'm not good. But the Bible says that we are found in him, not having our own righteousness, but the righteousness which is of God mm -hmm. by faith. Okay. Now that's eternal security. The Church of Christ also does not believe, or they believe rather, that the Lord's Supper should be every Sunday. What is their proof text? 
They don't have one. Uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, and we'll see what the Bible has to say about the period and the frequency of its use. 1 Corinthians 11, 25 and 26. First uh, Corinthians eleven twenty five and twenty six. It says, after the same manner, this is Paul recounting what Jesus did. He said, after the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. Does it say how often he does? It doesn't. Look at verse 26. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Does it say there how often? It is. It doesn't say. So what does that mean? It means that it is up to the believer's discretion and personal choice and their conviction as to how often they should do it. Here at the church, we do it once a month. Um, I know that the Church of Christ does it every Sunday, and some churches do it every once a year. Does it matter? It is a non-essential. I will say this for the Lord's Supper, that when you do it somewhat frequently, you do get that constant reminder of, my goodness, Jesus died for me. Mm. Now, you should be getting that from the sermons, too. <laughs> you should be in a cross preaching church but you need to have that remembrance it says here this, this duty as often as you drink it in remembrance of me we have to remember you know the Lord but does it say how often no I think some people in the brethren movements do it once a day but does it say how often to do it? No. So for the Church of Christ to put out a blanket statement that it should be every Sunday, and if you're not doing it every Sunday, you are ungodly and you are not doing right, that is putting words in the Bible that aren't there. And you're making a fool out of yourself. Okay, the next one. They believe that worship with instrumental music is sinful and disobedient to the Lord. So turn to the book of Psalms. Mm. Turn to the book of Psalms, 147, verse 7. Psalms 147, verse 7. Now, I realize that we're not Old Testament Jews. Uh, the Lord doesn't have much to say about it in the New Testament, but he also doesn't condemn it. You can't make an argument from silence. Mm -hmm. You know... I can't stand here and say, God condemns the biggest loser. Because I can't give you a chapter and verse. I can't do that. That'd be dumb. And I can't stand up here and condemn instrumental music because there's nothing in the Bible that even hints at that. Okay, look at uh, Psalms 147, verse 7. And it says this, Sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praise upon the harp unto our God. Now, if something hasn't changed in the, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, then you just kind of continue doing it, right? Unless the Holy Spirit gives you that clear distinction, oh, there's a difference now, right? Look at uh, Psalms 149, verse 3. It says there, let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and harp. So there's nothing wrong with the timbrel and harp. Let me make a comment about dance, however. Dance has been convoluted. Dance has been perverted. Well, I, I can say that for music too, though, can't mm -hmm. I? Mm -hmm. yes. So if there, I, I'm not going to see that in this church. I, I couldn't tolerate it as a pastor. I've been in churches where, where there there's women on the floor during the music and they're dancing and they're carrying flags and waving them. I, that's not, it's just not right. Mm -hmm. You say, what's, what's the difference? 
that can be a that can be a message entirely on its own. Yes. Mercy. But yes. dance in biblical times is not the dance that you see today. Mm -hmm. Not even remotely close. Um, there's a difference between an African sex dance and a biblical dance. There's a big difference. So we do have to use our common sense. We have to use our understanding. For instance, this doesn't mean that all instruments are necessarily created equal. I don't know if it would be really advantageous to have somebody up here with a big oboe and blowing out everybody's ear in here. Is that the word? Is that the instrument? Or a, or a big tuba? Or You know what I mean? Or, or the drums beating out everything and nobody can hear the singing and the, you know? You gotta use better judgment. You gotta use common sense. But there is nothing wrong. I can't think of any instrument by itself that is evil. I can't. You know? Mm -hmm. I mean, so, you know, I loved it when Daisy came up and played the ukulele and, yes. and I'm looking forward to more and more people learning some different instruments and bringing them up and playing them. I just don't want to see what I saw in one church one time where this black lady got up from Africa and she says, I've got Jesus in my feet. I've got Jesus in my hands. I Sit down. <laughs> That's not biblical, man. Jesus isn't in your hands. Jesus isn't in your feet. Jesus is right here in your heart. And uh, so something that was so unbiblically sound, just so off and so almost like ashamed for this person doing it, everybody in the church stands up and gives them a standing ovation. Mm -hmm. That's one thing the church does not have anymore, is spiritual discernment. Mm -hmm. But the best way to get spiritual discernment is to read this and read it and read it and read it and read it and read it, and read it yeah. until it gets old. <laughs> and, then, and do it again. And then do it again. Okay. Uh, look at uh, Psalms 33. Well, while we're at this close to it. Let's read Psalms 150, 1 through 6. 150, verses 1 through 6. We're already at 149. So it says here, Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. You know, I, I love the trumpet. You know, and I, I wish I was better at it. But occasionally I try to learn a song and do it from here, you know. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the psaltery and harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and organs. By the way, I have no problem with people tapping their feet in here and, and getting excited. And, you know, even the Gene Kim's church. You know, we went there. And people were literally during the singing, they were running around yeah. and shouting, Boy, it's good to be saved! You yeah, know, so that's exciting. You know, and, and I like that. And it should be that way. I don't think that we should be a dead... Praise God from whom all blessings flow. <laughs> be happy, you know. We, we ought to be happy. We're Christians, right? Yeah. We're going to heaven. But, you know, but use some common sense. As soon as somebody gets up in here and does some twerking, Whoa. get that demon-possessed person out of here. <laughs> no, no sex. You know what I mean? Nothing... Nothing that glorifies the body instead of glorifies Jesus. There's That's a big right. difference. That's right. And I've seen some people, I've seen some biblical dances, and I'm like, okay, that's, it's not me, it's not my flavor at all, but I can see it, and I'm like, I appreciate that. They're not, they're not bringing attention to their body. Mm -hmm. But almost any music, you, any dancing you see today is bringing attention to the body. And the, I'm not going to go there. Kids are in here. So anyways, <laughs> amen. <laughs> okay. Let's look at uh, Psalms. Uh, well, let's continue with this. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and organs. Mm. If an organ is played right, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals. Praise Him upon the high-sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. We should all be happy to be a Christian. We should all be willing to... Shout it out, bust it out, break it out, whatever it is, you know. Uh, it's okay. It's good. Man. Okay, let's look at Psalms 33, verse 3. There is nothing in the New Testament that counteracts this, okay? Nothing. Psalms 33, verse 3. 
sing unto him a new song. So we sing hymns here, that's true. But there is new music being written as we're speaking. There are some good Bible-believing Baptists that are actually writing some good music these days. Mm -hmm. And they're putting it out there. And, and so it's okay. You know, I want to get back to writing music again, too. I, I want to get back to it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we just got to be careful with it. That's why we always stick with the old-fashioned hymnal, you know? I don't know. But sing unto them a new song. Play skillfully. Play skillfully with a loud noise. Yes. So, with that being said, let me apologize for not playing very skillfully. And <laughs> but I'm trying, right? We try here at this church. We're not, a, we're not a professional job. We're just not. We're people. We're regular people, right? So, they believe that worship with instrumental music is sinful and disobedient to the Lord. It is not disobedient and sinful to the Lord. There's no verse that says that. Okay, now lastly, they believe that the church has a monopoly on salvation. Let's look at Acts chapter 4, verses 10 through 12, and then we'll be done. Acts chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. I hope you learned something tonight. Yes, amen. I hope that you got something, some kind of better understanding about what the Church of Christ is about. And not all churches of Christ are created equal. I realize that. I believe even in our town, there's some things going on that aren't exactly Church of Christ approved. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. But as a Bible-believing Christian, just stay away. Yes. Just stay away. We were reading that in uh, Warner View today about staying away from the hidden works of darkness, mm -hmm. the unfruitful works of darkness. And this is unfruitful. They believe the church, the church of Christ, has a monopoly on salvation. They believe that because it has church of Christ in it, that therefore that means it's the church that Christ founded. They are very much Roman Catholic. But if we're going to go based on that reasoning, then wouldn't you agree that the Mormon church actually has the best claim to the title? Mm. The Church of Jesus Christ? Of Latter-day Latter Saints. I mean, forget that. Yeah. <laughs> it just goes to show that the name doesn't mean much. No. We can call ourselves the first church of Jesus Christ of Alturas, California, and it wouldn't mean Jack Squat. Yes, so, what you call a church doesn't mean anything. Just like if you are married to a spouse and you're having spousal arguments and you stand up and you say, our marriage is perfect. Haven't you ever heard of a phrase meaning, uh, haven't you ever heard of a phrase basically not holding weight? Mm -hmm. You know, just because you say something doesn't mean it's true. Mm -hmm. I'm an astronaut. It doesn't really mean anything. It's kind of fun to say. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. Because <laughs> none of you believe me. <laughs> all right. Acts chapter 4, 10 through 12. One of these days I'll be an astronaut, though. I'm going to fly through all the stratospheres and atmospheres and hydrospheres and all those things. And I'm going to go 10 go. trillion miles past the farthest star. Yes. Right. That's going to be something. <laughs> You're not John Glenn. Yeah, I'm John, but I'm not John Glenn. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. <clears throat> Let me just... Write this up here on the board and we close. Any other. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Mm. So folks, if you're going to get saved, you're going to get saved by Jesus. Christ himself. You're going to get saved by a person, not by a church. That's right. I can't save you. I've never been able to change anybody. 
I can't change my wife. I can't change my son. I can't change. I have a hard enough time changing myself. Uh, but Jesus Christ is the greatest change agent you've ever seen. That's right. But any other? Okay. How about any church? How about any priest? How about any guru? How about any father? Any bishop? Any five-step plan? There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And that is Jesus Christ. Yeah. I don't care what you call your church. Who cares? This will never save you. I don't care if you even have the Apostle Peter come to your church, resurrect himself, and give a sermon over at the Church of Christ. That doesn't make that the church that will save you. Yeah. No church has a monopoly on salvation. Right. None. Only Jesus Christ. All right. With that being said, I am not a Church of Christ individual. I am a Bible-believing Baptist. Yes, amen. Yes, amen. And again, you say, well, Baptist isn't in the name. Again, there's other reasons why Baptist isn't in our name. But we are a church that is built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. But we can't save you. Only Jesus Christ can. That's right. Okay, let's go ahead and close with the prayer. And then we'll go ahead and uh, get on with our last song, which is going to be 502. Uh, Dad, would you close us in prayer tonight for the message and then we'll sing the song.